all hell breaks loose. On the way to us, the cat team hits a complex ambush. Basically, the enemy had set in barricades to channelize them to come a certain way. And they had IEDs, machine guns from above, down into the, the canal, essentially, of the street. They had uh, RPGs, like everything you can imagine was coming at us. And <laughs> as soon as we break down and get outside, then we're getting engaged with small arms fire. And, and it's a show. We have no comms. We can't get a hold of the cat team. They're in contact. We're in contact. Our other squads are in contact from their buildings. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have an important combat story with former MARSOC Special Operator and Marine Rifleman Mike Block. Mike served multiple combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan with conventional and special ops forces, returned with PTSD and TBI like so many, but persevered. He went on to serve in a contractor role with JSOC, created his own company, and founded a nonprofit to help other veterans. On February 15th of 2022, Mike was on his way to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, for a business meeting when he suffered a mental breakdown brought on by a combination of high stress, lack of sleep, and a drug called Nuvigil, prescribed by the VA to Mike for over four years when it shouldn't be taken for more than 12 weeks. Mike is now being treated as a violent criminal by the North Carolina court system and a district attorney who has decided to target an honorable veteran who spent years in combat. The DA said at Mike's trial for September 11th, in case you want to understand just how out of touch this is. Part of the reason we created Combat Story was for politicians to understand what really happens to veterans when they're sent downrange, from the trauma and loss during combat to the experience when they return home and try to reintegrate. This interview does exactly that. Try to imagine where you were on Christmas Day in 2004, compare it to Mike's experience that you'll hear in this episode. Listen to the number of brothers he lost along the way and try to understand what it's like to lead a normal life afterwards. Beyond an amazing set of combat stories, this is also an episode about how we treat our veterans when they come home. If Mike's story moves you as it did me, I'd ask you to check out the UAP site, which is the nonprofit that's representing Mike, and donate what you can. You can also write your congressman and ask to move this case to a veteran court designed for just these types of events. You can find all the necessary links in the episode description. This is a special one, and I hope you enjoy this very humble combat story from a very honorable veteran as much as I did. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you, Ryan, for having me on here. It's uh, a pleasure. Uh, You know, I've been looking at your podcast for a little while and definitely very humbled to be uh on here today well i mean i I think it's worth noting christian holloway was the the reason we connected you know a former marsoc teammate of yours uh, my understanding um for people who've listened to this podcast they've heard him a couple times and he's been on some other podcasts as well um but you know just his uh his judge of character and recommendation go a long way in my book so i'm so glad that we got you here and i think one of the reasons that I started this thing a couple of years ago that I would just call out is uh, in my mind, I kind of wanted a platform to share with specifically politicians, like when they're making a decision to send people down range that they have got maybe a little more context if they never served. But I think your story in particular reinforces something where maybe there's a different audience of people who need to understand what folks went through down range and what that leads to on the back end, specifically for the, uh, the situation you find yourself in. So I hope that we can tell a story of the challenges that guys like you go through and what that means when you come out on the other side. But I was hoping we could start out if you could share a little bit of the, uh, the events that have unfolded recently that you're dealing with, not recent anymore, but that are becoming, uh, more recent, uh, with every closing day. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, so, uh, today is, the the 25th my wife and i can't, did a countdown last night actually uh right after we got the kids to bed we're about 17 days away from a felony trial uh that i'm going to be facing for uh actions that occurred that i i wasn't even consciously present to be you know witness to um there was a 
interaction with a drug that I had been prescribed by the VA because of some of the injuries that I have from my time in service and from combat. Um, you know, PTSD and TBI are very real. And, uh, you know, the, the global war on terrorism generation is honestly, in my opinion, just starting to transition, um, you know, in totality uh, from from service. And and it's a big issue that needs to be addressed. So um, anyway, that that event happened February 15th of 2022. Um, and, you know, like you said, it, it's it is recent. Uh even for me, again, because we kept it quiet for so long. Um, partly, you know, a little bit of that was me feeling ashamed and uh, just not knowing how to deal with it uh, and going through my own journey of, of recovery and healing, you know. And so we were also strung along by the district attorney and prosecutor and led to believe that there was a, a way to work this out. And, um, unfortunately it's come down to the wire and they're, they're not willing to be reasonable anymore. And I have to go face a criminal trial now. And, and this is events that took place in the civilian world post-service, as you mentioned, you were prescribed, um, a drug that had some side effects and then, a civilian incident happened. This was not in uniform, just for people listening. Yes, correct. Correct. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. So just to, as we get into your career, Mike, could you take us back to kind of like where you grew up and under what circumstances? Like what drove you to the military to begin with? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I grew up in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, it's the home of the Jayhawks. You know, it's literally the Midwest. Um Every kind of cliche thing you could imagine, uh, I had the, the quintessential childhood growing up in the 80s. Uh, you know, my elementary school was right behind our house. And, you know, we'd play outside until the streetlights came on and then even beyond that sometimes, you know, and it was drinking from the water hose. It was uh, everything about being out in nature, exploring and boys being boys. I had two childhood friends that I grew up with um, since we were in diapers, Johnny and Eric. And uh, and both of us or all three of us, you know, ended up joining the Marine Corps together. No way. It was something that we. Oh, yeah. It was something we had talked about as kids, um, you know, and I've, I've kind of told this story before. Eric had this poster on his wall of a recon Marine. Uh, with night vision goggles, you know, and it was just something we aspired to be. Uh, we all had K bars as kids, you know, and we'd be out in the, out in the woods doing field craft, uh, just trying to emulate that kind of lifestyle. And so when 9-11 happened, it, that was it. That was our call to arms, our reason to join. And I reached out to them and I said, let's do this, guys. We talked about it as kids. It's like, this is our time. And so Eric and I joined together. We went through the buddy program, um, at, you know, in Marine Corps boot camp, West Coast. And then Johnny ended up joining a year after us because he was just one year behind in school. But um, that, that was it. You know, Dang. the adventure took off. So no, it wasn't a family history of military service. No, no. Uh, well, my grandfather served during World War II. He was a pilot. Um, but I didn't really know him growing up. Uh, he died when I was pretty young and, uh, you know, my father didn't really talk a lot about his childhood. He had his own, you know, trauma that he experienced and dealt with, you know, and so it's, uh, something that in the later years of his life, he's finally kind of opening up about. And, you know, so I'm finding out about that now, but it wasn't a factor that, that yeah. drove me that. Jeez. And it was really just uh, this, what Eric or Johnny had the poster on the wall. You, d you decide to go. Why? Um, or maybe how old were you when 9-11 happened? Just for context. Uh, so I was 17. I was in college, actually. I graduated early. Uh, and so I went to, to college in the fall of 2001. I was 17 years old. Um, so, you know, I couldn't even join without my parents' consent, but um, I wasn't going to ask them for permission. You know, I, it just kind of wasn't my thing. So I, I waited until 
I turned 18 and then uh, went right to the recruiter in Wyoming was where I was living and where I was going to college at the time. And so uh, initially, I I think I was trying to go Intel. I wanted to, to be uh, you know, an intelligence specialist. And that was just kind of where I, th- I thought I saw myself as something challenging that would, um, aspire to my kind of more analytical minded, uh, brain. And the, the boat spaces for that didn't, they weren't open. And so it just kept delaying things. So, uh, at that point I was like, all right, you know, I did one semester of college, I was like, if I finish a second semester, I'll have enough credits where I can get this meritorious promotion right out of boot camp. Um, so I, you know, just kind of use that time to get extra credits for college. And uh, the time came when Eric was uh, done with school. He was ready to join. And I reached back out to the recruiter and I was like, all right, I want to both space for boot camp now. Uh, you know, like we were starting to hear about the the invasion to Iraq starting to build up. And, and he said, well, the only thing there is, is infantry. And I was like, well, then that's what I want. Send me, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we just didn't look back. Wait, why didn't, why did you end up going the college route instead of enlisting at that time, uh, pre nine 11? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so I wasn't the the easiest kid on my parents. And, uh, <laughs> as a, as a young boy, I was getting into trouble with girls and they, um, I came from a very strict Catholic, uh, family and I was the oldest of seven. And Whoa. so, uh, yeah, when I'm sneaking out at night, you know, to go do things, um, <laughs> that didn't sit well, you know, and it wasn't, I wasn't, setting a good example for my younger siblings and my parents basically threw down, uh, an ultimatum at me. It was military school or this youth ranch. And, uh, and I was like, no, I I will never join the military. I I saw it as like this, um, this thing that was being forced on me. And so it, it just, uh, it didn't sit well with me at that time when I was, you know, 14 rebellious and, you know, trying to, just find my own way in the world. Uh, so I ended up on this youth ranch and, uh, that's where I ended up finishing high school. Why I was able to graduate early. Um, it turned my life around completely. Wow. Uh, it was probably one of the the most incredible experiences I've had. And it it really set a a different, uh, path for me. You know, it, it showed me the value of hard work, the value of, uh, you know, what it takes to accomplish something and, and how consistency and perseverance and dedication matter. Um, and so, you know, I kind of wanted to stick with that. I fell in love with horses. So I had, you know, I had a horse at the time and, um, that was it. I wanted to go to school to learn more about equestrian studies. And, and so that's what I did out in Wyoming. And then, uh, it was the morning of nine 11. I was, uh, shoveling out this, the horse stall. And I just heard on the radio what had happened, uh, with the towers. And I knew right then I was like, no, I'm, I'm an American and like, whatever I thought about the military doesn't matter. I, I want to go fight for my country now. Jeez. If, if you had not, if nine 11 hadn't happened, you're still on that ranch, you go to college. Like, what do you think you would have ended up doing for a career? Oh, I I probably just would have been a ranch hand, honestly, you know, like maybe started, I I probably would have, I was very into that whole Western culture and I was really good at, uh, training horses. Um, so I, I probably would have done well, uh, in that community. I was, uh, getting in with, um, some pretty, I I can't even remember. This is like stretching my brain so hard right now. Uh, (laughs) But the the people that were relevant during that time frame, I was involved with uh, their methodology of training horses and teaching and emulating that and doing doing pretty well. But yeah, never That's, thought about that. That is super interesting. Okay, so so you make the decision to go in. It sounds like at that time you've been away from your family for a couple of years. Um, was 
Was there much of a discussion or pushback from your folks when you had this uh, decision? No, they, at this point, they were kind of thankful. I wasn't doing great in school. Um, you know, I had uh, essentially been on a youth ranch with uh, very strict rules. And then now I'm 17 in college, you know, with all this freedom and um, my grades weren't great, you know, and so they weren't uh, very pleased with that, obviously, you know, and and so any anything that was positive and that I chose to take on with passion, they were very pleased about and happy. And, uh, you know, my my dad at the time was working in government. Uh, he was in the Department of Justice. So, um, you know, it, it was very fitting. Got it. Um, I, the way you described the youth ranch and that kind of formative experience you had, a lot of guys I've interviewed talk about basic in the Marine Corps, providing a lot of what you described there. Did you feel like you had already experienced or, or gotten some of the maturity you needed from that youth ranch and it wasn't as big a factor when, when you went through basic? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it allowed me to not get sucked into the chaos. It allowed me to just kind of step back a second and, and just observe things better. Um, cause I just had, you know, a lot of life experience to pull on and, uh, a lot of adversity dealing with other young men. Um, which I think is one of the, the biggest things that you face in boot yeah. camp is, you know, they throw all the case, the chaos at you. Boot camp is about teaching you to let go of yourself, to figure out how to work with others through adversity and, and have a certain outcome occur. Right. Um, and so I, I think I had a leg up going in on that where, the chaos didn't affect me like it did others. And, and because of that, I think that, you know, I was able to kind of connect with people a little differently. And to me, it just wasn't as hard. And somehow like being that calm, um, kind of collected individual among the fray, it, it calms other people down, you know, and then you figure out like, all right, let's get through this. And, and you just put the other bullshit aside. Were you calm like that before you went to the youth ranch? Was that like a common personality trait for you as you were growing up? Or did that, that experience at the ranch change that? It, it is, I guess, like a little bit of an innate characteristic of mine. Uh, my mother is, is probably the most calm and patient person that I've met. Um, you know, and, and my wife, uh, like has commented to me about that, you know, you're very much like your mother and your personality like that. Uh, so I think that there, there was an aspect that, that got pulled out because of the adversity at the ranch. Yeah. Got it. Um, one of the things that this might just be an off the wall question, but you know, you don't run into many people who have trained horses the way you described. Is there any, learning that you drew from training horses when it came to maybe working with or training uh, Marines um, as you're moving into leadership positions? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it becomes about connection, right? And the, the way that you actually train a horse is building trust. And that transfers like so i mean it's it's an obvious thing when you say it you know um but learning that and learning it with the adversity of the struggle of the horse fighting you through the process and you're and you're trying to still make that connection and tell them it's okay like this isn't bad you're you're reacting like that just because of your nature but we can work together and make this better, you know? And so learning that in a, uh, in a very just kind of free environment and, you know, wide open nature, God's country out in Wyoming, um, it kind of built almost a, like 
a warrior mindset, you know, like when you really think about true warriors and warrior cultures, like, and you look back on history and those cultures, um, most warriors are very stoic and they're very, uh, contemplative and they understand the value of human connection. And so I, I think that I, I definitely did have a leg up going in. That's awesome. For sure. Just a quick thanks to our sponsor, Rocket Money, and we'll get right back to this combat story. Like many people, my family tends to have subscriptions for so many different services where we buy a subscription and don't realize we're paying a higher rate than we should. I often sign up for something and then forget about it, all the while paying for that service month after month, even when I'm not using it or just paying too much. I've used Rocket Money for a few things, but a favorite of mine has been canceling these unwanted subscriptions. For starters, as soon as I signed up, Rocket Money grouped all my subscriptions in one place, and I noticed I was paying for three services I hadn't used in over eight months that were all add-on channels at Amazon. I was able to cancel them quickly through the service, saving $23 a month. Next, I used the Rocket Money Rate Negotiation Service for my recurring bills, Rocket Money will identify which ones could be lower, and then with just the click of a button and filling out a few items, the service will go on to renegotiate a fee for me. I use this for Sirius XM, which I've been using for over 18 months. Rocket Money negotiated a new price, saved me $218 a year. I didn't have to call or talk to anyone. Rocket Money just sent me emails to keep me updated and had it done in 10 days. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions like I did and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash combat story. That's rocketmoney.com slash combat story. And one more time, rocketmoney.com slash combat story. And now back to this episode. Now, since you joined post 9-11, I got to imagine that they were, especially in the infantry and the Marine Corps, like probably pushing people to get out to the front lines. Was, was there that sense of urgency? Did you feel that kind of going into the pipeline? Oh yeah, right away. Um, boot camp had a, a very uh, heavy presence of of that that almost like being forged for war. Um, and our drill instructors like nailed that into our heads, and then that carried on into the school of infantry, where you know we're getting briefings about the units we're going to go to where they are in active combat in you know, the March to Baghdad. Um, and we knew that we were going over there as combat replacements. So it was, it was serious stuff, you know, and, and we, we were learning also from people that didn't have combat experience. Yeah. Um, wow. So it was, it was a real interesting time. Jeez. So how long is it? Are we talking just maybe like five, six months before from when you like hit boot camp to your getting pushed forward? Uh, so I went to boot camp December 9th of 2002. And then wow. I was forward in Iraq in May of wow. 2003. That's wow. a combat replacement. Jeez. So the the march to Baghdad has happened at that time, right? So what yes. can you talk us through like, right, you uh you're a corporal at the time, what are you doing? Who do you get assigned to? And are you going in there like as an individual person just being pushed to the front? Uh so at this point I think I'm I think I'm still at PFC, like a private first class. And uh I'm with probably a dozen other Marines that I had gone through ITC with. And then we get transferred down to 29 Palms, uh, California to one seven. So first battalion, seven Marines. And we're there for about two or three weeks in this remain behind element. Um, and you know, just doing training, getting gear issued. Uh, and then the stop loss, uh, is lifted. And so everyone that had been held past their, uh, EAS or their, uh, what is it? Exit of active service, mm -hmm. um, or end of active service. Everyone that was pushed past that point got sent back. And so then all of our seniors who are war heroes get a hold of us in the barracks <laughs> and some alcohol. And, uh, you know, you can imagine what happened. But, uh, 
So there was a command investigation for hazing and all sorts of nonsense, but um, we did learn a lot from them. They they instilled uh, some some real good uh, experiences in us through just basically explaining everything that they had gone through and then bringing us up to speed on standard operating procedures for the unit um, and just kind of getting us into the mindset of what we would be walking into. But uh, and sorry, Mike, real quick, very they, helpful. They had a fairly quick push into Baghdad, right? And then, then you're saying like, they kind of pop out and they're, I, I would assume you're kind of transitioning into this more urban environment. So how much of what they're explaining to you translated once you actually get in? Still a useful. decent amount, actually. Yeah. yeah. Only because uh, the the role that we took, uh, so my platoon, I was second platoon Baker Company. And we were, at first, we were at uh, Babylon, um, Camp Babylon, it was uh, all Hilla. And uh, it's essentially where the, like, actual Babylonian Empire, uh, the gates of Ishtar, like it was, it was pretty cool. I got to see all of that, like with my own eyes, um, you know, like the throne of Nebuchadnezzar's, like there's still bricks from that. Uh, well, there were, there were, ISIS yeah. destroyed that. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, at that, at that post we had, um, base security and, uh, we were the QRF. So anything that happened, we would react to it. Um, and then we also did presence patrols outside of the base. And so, uh, the, the patrolling aspect is what really mattered, you know, because all of their SOPs and lessons learned from the push, um, you know, and convoys and taking contact, things of that, that nature, uh, that, that did matter. And that did add up. Jeez. What was how did you feel about it as you're getting ready to go forward to that, to, to your platoon, basically, um, having seen what you saw on TV happening, talking to these guys, how a lot of anxiety, is it like, I can't wait to get in there. And is, is Eric or Johnny in your unit with you at this time? Uh, so no, we get separated after SOI. Johnny, Johnny go, he went to, um, one, four and then Eric was with three, five. Um, and so both of those units saw some heavy stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there, that's a whole nother story, right? <laughs> but, um, so excitement, uh, it was, it was very, all right. So backing up a step, I've watched a ton of movies, like leading up to my time at boot camp. So from basically it was like nine eleven until December, almost a little over a year, you know, and I was like, all right, everything I can do to prepare for boot camp. So I'm watching everything about Vietnam, you know, documentaries, movies, uh, I went to like this local, uh, thrift store, army surplus, like thrift store. And I bought, uh, jungle boots and an owl pack. And I was out there doing rock runs. Like awesome. it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah. So I was excited. I was, it was this time where I, I got to actually go be a young man and prove myself. Um, you know, and, and that, I had kind of grown up in this, you know, fantastical kind of life where, you know, I was a cowboy for a, a long time, like living crazy, crazy life that they're out in Wyoming doing that. You know, I was like trying to chase black bears on a horse with a rope, you know, like doing crazy stuff. <laughs> Is that um, for real? You know, so, it, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you might have to come back to that one. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, so it, it was just more of, of this story of, you know, excitement and the adventure, you know, I was going off to war with my brothers, um, and I was ready for it. 
how how close did you feel to these other Marines since it sounds like you were kind of pushed forward that you didn't do the train up with them? They'd just gone through, you know, across the berm. How did you integrate with those guys? Um, so the first first night uh, I get to the platoon and we're living in some serious Spartan conditions. <laughs> like we're literally living in the dirt with cots and a cami net tent over us. Um, it, it was miserable. And there's like all the stories that are, you hear, like camel spiders, like those were real. Oh, those you know, things scare me, man. And, oh, I know. They would crawl across the ground, you know, and you'd hear Marines like scream like little girls and their silkies like jumping on the cots, you know. Uh, but anyway, so I, I come in there and I see this and I'm like, holy shit, like I'm really with the grunts in the mud, you know, like this in this Vietnam mindset of like platoon, you know, being in the mud with the men. And I'm like, all right, I'm here. And then my lieutenant comes out and, and uh, (laughs) I, I can't share too much about uh, his background because it'll like give away who he is. But uh, anyway, he, (laughs) he's like this huge dude, just jacked. And, uh, he comes out and he's just got his cami bottoms on no shirt. And he's like, welcome to the unit, man. You know? And then he comes and like puts us up against this wall and then has us, <laughs> this is crazy. Has us, uh, like bend over and start hyperventilating, like breathing in and out as fast as we can. And then we have to stand up and hold our breath. And he comes by and clamps down our carotid until we pass out. And then like just drops us, you know, like a sack of potatoes to the ground. And like, that was it. That was the initiation. And he's like, you're part of the unit now, you know, and it's like, what What just happened? You know? And and then the next day we're like out on patrol and it's like condition one, fully loaded, ready to go. And I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm just, PFC just joining the military and I'm thinking like, all right, we're going to see like some bad stuff and then nothing, you know? Nothing. And it was, it was, it was a little underwhelming. My first deployment ultimately um, from a combat perspective, we got shot at a few times and had some incidents, but it, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, and, and I don't mean to say that in a way that makes it sound like a glorify war, but you know, this is something that we train yeah. for. Um, and under under the auspice of defending our nation and, and our interests, you know, we're it was a just cause. And so I, I do want to just clarify a little bit yeah. about it. Um, but, you know, that's how it went down. Oh, first deployment, at least. And, and you're what, like 18 at this time? Maybe 19? 18. That's crazy. Okay, so... I also want to know this uh, platoon leader. Um, did he end up being a good officer? Like that's an oh, awesome. way to welcome someone. It's yeah. It, uh, it, it just it was uh, kind of part personality, um, but then I don't know. There there were a lot of shenanigans, you know, like the the early G Watt days of the military. I'm sure you saw it. It was kind of the wild west you know like roes were loose uh there no one no one even thought like oh hey if you go send a bunch of young men into combat and then bring them home and immediately let them out on libo for four days like that's cool that that couldn't cause any problems (laughs) you know and then let's let's do it on a cycle and we just keep feeding them into the machine and then things, you know, it got bad in, in Iraq and the violence got really bad and the combat got really gnarly. And Can so, we, you oh, know, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. no I, I was just going to ask on that first, on that first deployment, is that, do you remember the first time that you were in contact, had to pull the trigger, even if it wasn't as, as maybe aggressive as future deployments would be? Certainly at the age of 18, it's something that most 18 year olds are not doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, so my first, 
scenario, I guess, uh, my first encounter um, with something of a combat nature had no shots fired. Uh, and it, it was actually because of my actions. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting because we're just out on this patrol uh, at night, presence patrol outside of the, the compound. And it was kind of like jungle um, environment. It was kind of like a jungle environment. We're right off the Euphrates River, so it's very green. And um, I just remembered it was hot as hell. Bugs everywhere, you know. And and at this point, everyone's running the most basic equipment you can imagine. Like whatever you're issued right out from you know, your, your stuff is what you have. Like the, at this point, no one was buying gear yet. Um, and so we had M16, A2s, uh, like Vietnam era bayonets. We had, uh, every squad had one set of, uh, ACOGs, which was the, you know, the reticle with the, I think it was four power, uh, zoom on it. So, so like I was that guy, fortunately. So I had, um, I had that and a set of, uh, 14s and like, I had it all set up on my rifle. I thought it was pretty cool. You know, like I'm the DM guy for the team. Why they give that to you as such a young guy, Mike? Um, I think I came into country with it, if I remember right. Ah, So I think that. It was post invasion, you know, and it's like, oh, wait, we need to give the military more money, more equipment. And I think it was in reserves ready to go forward. And because we were the combat replacements, I had that. I think yeah. that's probably why. But at the same time, um, you know, they also put me out on point, <laughs> you know, so like it's like you're the the FNG, like go out in front. Um, and I was I was good with it. You know, it was just. That was my role. I was the rifleman, point man, and uh, we we're out on patrol. And we came up to do a short security halt, uh, you know, drink water and just take a rest. We've been moving for pretty long distance. And so we come up to this kind of what appears to be abandoned building and uh, our squad leader sets us in around it. And I'm in my sector of fire, just covering down. And I see two individuals up on the top of this roof start moving. So I hold on, them, you know, and I'm trying to get my fire team leaders attention and, you know, pass it up the chain command, everything. And, uh, and then it's pretty obvious. I hear AK rack, you know, and so I stand up and they, they had told us, you know, like a little basic Arabic. And I, so I yelled out stop, or at least what I thought it was, you know, and, uh, and and held down on them, you know, and and I had I had them in my sights, and I was well within the ROEs to to have engaged, but something just told me to hold off. Um, you know, I was more concerned about the fields of fire where we had guys on the other side of the building, and I knew as soon as if I engaged, I didn't know how many other people were up there, um, and and if I did that, what was that going to kick off? What kind of chain of events? Uh, and and so I got my fire team leader's attention, squad leader. We sent people up on the roof and detained them. And ultimately, that that decision, who knows, uh, you know what it did. But there there were three people up on the roof. They had multiple AKs uh, and an RPG. So you know, who knows what could have kicked off had I had I pulled that trigger. But that led my development and. Uh, strategy thinking and and like how I process things um, and applied those in real time scenarios in combat. Was there any second guessing either on your part while you you're kind of holding on these guys or afterwards from some of the other Marines like hey you should have just taken the shot on those guys because it seems like a wise decision no no rounds are fired three guys captured no loss of life on either side. Yeah. Um, no, I was actually, uh, you know, given accolades. Um, nice. no one, no one questioned it. Uh, it, it was good. I mean, it was a good call. 
And how long did you end up being on that deployment, Mike, since you joined so, through there? Yes. So we, we get there May. We ended up coming home in October. Uh, wow. We were the last infantry uh, battalion to leave Iraq. And it, it was it was pretty eerie. Um, I didn't realize all of this at the time, but having looked back on it now, um, we witnessed the actual turning of events that led to us being there for 10 more plus years, you know? Uh, and it was the, the bombing of the Shia mosque in Najaf in, and I want to say it was September, um, of 2003. And that event led to the rise of the sectarian violence in the Sunni Shia clashes that ultimately led to the, the Sunni awakening and all of the fighting that we saw out in Anbar for the following deployments. Jeez. Did, did anybody realize that's what was about to kick off when that happened? No. No, we were we were doing turnover at the time with the Spanish uh, multinational coalition um, out of Najaf. And we were, I think, in the middle of doing some training or you know, something of that nature. It was pretty stationary, I remember. Um, and we saw or we heard the explosion and then saw the cloud go up from the mosque and wow. we're like, oh, you know, the, who knows what that was. But uh, we knew that it wasn't a, anything U.S. Uh, it wasn't an attack on the U.S. So uh, that was kind of like all I knew at the point. But um, when it was probably probably like six, seven years later when I like actually put all that together. Yeah. Jeez. Just a quick thanks to our sponsor, Delete Me, and we'll get right back to this combat story. Not sure if everyone is familiar with the term doxing, but as I've mentioned on the show, having served at the CIA and in the private sector tracking down bad actors, I'm very familiar with the way online and personally identifiable information can be used against someone. In fact, I've been doxed several times over the past three years where my personal information has been shared online. This is possible because data brokers collect huge amounts of PII, create profiles and listings that can include social security numbers, birthdays, past addresses, and more. These data brokers crawl the web to get this information. Delete me will find this information online and remove it so it can't be surfaced. I signed up and received a bespoke report for myself and my family that showed me all the places my information had surfaced, what information they had, like name, address, phone number, social, and more, and that it had been removed. We all have the right to stay private and protect our personal data. Head to joindeleteme.com and use the code COMBAT for 20% off your plan and avoid being doxxed and harassed like what's happened to me. And now, back to this combat story. How many how many deployments do you end up doing before before you leave the Marine Corps? Just so we have context here, because you started early. Yeah, so I did. Um, so 2003, I was in Iraq for the the combat replacement through October. Then I went back to uh, Husaba, which is in Al Qaim. Um, I went there 2004, I think it was like August or September, and we were there April 2005. Jeez. And then uh, I went back in 2006, February, um, February to September, uh, same city. Jeez. Okay. Yeah, and, and then, oh, yeah. And then Marsoc. Uh, sorry. So that was just, yeah. And then with Marsoc, um, Jordan... Senegal and Afghanistan. Jeez. Okay. Got it. Did you end up doing Fallujah in 04? No. So when Phantom Fury kicked off, we were on the Syrian border. So leading up to Phantom Fury, all the foreign fighters that were coming in for, for the fight in Fallujah, because it was well advertised. I mean, yeah. you know, we see all the things that Matt has said, right. You know, um, all those foreign fighters flowed through us. And so they would come through town and we would get these Intel reports, you know, like uh, a caravan of fighters in Syria is going to be here in the next, you know, couple of nights, like be on the lookout and Jeez. we'd bang it out with them. And some of them would survive and then go on to Fallujah. Wow. It was crazy. Okay. 
Um, so I, I'd like to talk about that deployment, but just real quick, you're coming back in 03 as an 18 year old, you've seen your first combat for five months. Um, what's the transition back home like, and how quick are you, are you excited to get back at that again? Like, are you looking forward to that next deployment? Yeah. So we get back home and it's, you know, like I kind of had mentioned, we just get turned loose and we're, I mean, we're war heroes, you know, yeah. like it was in the news. Like we had this great, uh, welcoming. We got, got back at March air force base in Riverside, California. They had, uh, you know, the fire trucks shooting archway coming off the plane for us. Um, families, you know, like everything you could imagine. It was, it was great. We got coolers of beer waiting for us when we get off the plane. And, uh, you know, we were, we were young dudes. Just, we thought, all right, this is it. This is what you do. You party like a rock star. And then we realized that, okay, wait, we're going to go back to Iraq in a few months now. Uh, we got to do a training or a workout now, you know? And so there was like, all right, right back at it. And it was just everything that we could do to prepare. Um, and we took it serious, you know, and we, we were looking at what was happening. Uh, we knew a unit we were going to go replace. We ended up going to uh, Camp Gannon, which was where Jason Dunham um, earned his medal of honor, jumping on that grenade. So, uh, you know, we, we knew the stakes and we knew what was, what was coming. So it was work hard, play hard. And still kind of that sense of excitement to be getting back into it's still at this point. Yeah. Um, nothing that our unit had, had seen and, you know, the, the invasion or my time there, uh, left, left us with, you know, uh, bad taste for combat yeah. or, you know, we, we only lost, um, one Marine and it was from an accident. Uh, you know, so there wasn't a lot of, uh, the trauma, you know, yeah. on us yet. So as you look back at the O four, 4 or even the, the subsequent deployment while you're still a uh, conventional Marine, what are one or two of the tougher experiences that you recall when you're downrange for those? And, you know, it can be tough from an emotional standpoint, leadership, um, losing somebody, but what, what comes to mind for you in those moments? Yeah. So one of the most memorable, um, engagements was, December 24th, it was Christmas Eve. Um, we, we had been getting mortared daily. Uh, and, and it was, it was getting to the point where like, they were pretty precise with it. Um, you know, there were casualties and, uh, it's just, you know, it's no way, no way to live when you're trying to just like go eat. And you got to worry about some falling from the sky to kill you. And, uh, and so we were trying to be more proactive to send out squads to set up counter ambushes for the poof sites. Um, and, and we have been doing this for probably uh, a couple of months uh, between we would rotate between platoons. Uh, we had a uh, force recon embedded with us and then we also had a state platoon of uh, snipers. And so it, everyone was taking turns to go out and do their part. Um, we're also doing uh, raids, you know, so we would go just do hard hits with recon. Uh, we were their security element. So we would hold the outer court on. And, um, you know, and so there, there was like lots of combat leading up to this event. And, and so you know, we were just in the thick of it. We had been there for a few months now. Um, and, and it was really starting to build up. We'd lost a lot of guys already. IEDs, rockets, RPGs, mortars, snipers, small arms fire, 
ambulances packed with explosives, like suicide vests, you name it, we saw it. Um, so December 24th, my platoon, we go out uh, in three separate squads in mutually supporting positions. We sneak out in the middle of the night and take down three different uh, houses and so the house that we chose um, was a three-story building overlooking the soccer field on the far end of the town uh, of, of Huseba. And so they're using that soccer field as their uh, site where they were launching mortars from. And so we were the, – the way that the city was set up was a, a box, right? So square and uh, the East End Road – was the main route that ran after you would come in through the border checkpoint. Um, you could take the market street and then the East end road uh, would take you out of town towards uh, all kind. And so we were kind of on that main Avenue of approach um, this three story building. And I remember I had to climb the entire building, come in through a window uh with you know a couple other dudes sneak down to the front door unlock it while his family's in this house asleep let the rest of the squad in and then yeah and then we we hold them hostage um while we set up our our positions and we're on overwatch for you know we got to have 360 security um we've basically locked down this compound our supporting squads are spread uh, across this East end road, you know, so we're a few houses away from each other, but we can, we have like intersecting fields of fire. Um, and we've all got, uh, you know, prick one seventeen radios for inner inner squad comms and back to, uh, the main camp. Um, and so December 24th, we set in and, you know, we're just expecting the worst, and and we wait all day December 25th because kind of the game was it was a cat, cat and mouse game like the enemy knew that we were sneaking out and doing this and so they would try and figure out where we were and then ambush us in the counter ambush site um and it wasn't that hard to, for them to figure out they just find where kids weren't playing or that family didn't come out and do whatever they were supposed to do in the community that day. Like, Oh, that's where the Marines are. Um, and we had quite a few instances where, you know, like you'd be on post and a freaking rocket would come through the window and then it would just kick off a, a whole complex ambush. Um, and so we were waiting for it. We, we figured Christmas day, like they're going to, they have to do something, you know? Uh, and because we were pushing the threshold of, of like our limit of advance for where like we could go without like getting in a gunfight. We were well beyond that. Um, and so we, we just knew something was going to come and, and it was just eerily quiet all day and no one was outside. Like there were no kids usually Friday in in the Muslim world. Like that's, that's their mosque day. There was no call to prayer. It was just weird. And, um, sure enough, our radio goes out. So we have no comms and our, our no comm plan is to break down and get picked up by our cat team, which is just light skin Humvees, uh, with, you know, uh, machine guns and Mark 19s on the, the turrets. Uh, and they're just going to come pick us up. And then do like a couple fake drops and we'll go reset into a new uh, hide site. And so we're like, we hit that, that time threshold of the no comm window. So we know that they're coming out and, you know, we know that we're supposed to get ready and all hell breaks loose. Like on the way to us, the cat team hits a complex ambush basically the enemy had set in barricades and man like built barricades to channelize them to come a certain way. And they had IEDs guys like machine guns from, from uh, above down into the, 
uh, you know, the canal essentially of the street. They had uh, RPGs, like everything you can imagine was coming at us. And uh, <laughs> as soon as we break down and get outside, then we're getting engaged with small arms fire. And, and it's a shit show. We have no comms. We can't get a hold of the cat team. They're in contact. We're in contact. Our other squads are in contact from their buildings. And it's, it, it is just insanity. Like, tracers everywhere you're you just can't figure out what's going on and then finally uh one of the vehicles breaks through they you know break contact and are getting to us and (laughs) i remember my uh saw gunner comes like running up to the vehicle and he goes to grab the door and rips the door handle off of the humvee and he's like freaking out just smashing it against the window like let me in let me in you know and it's just like nerves are just on blast you know and i'm like dude go around you know it's like let's get in and we're just trying to load up and get out of there i mean we got rounds skipping off the ground right around us hitting the vehicle we've got um you're like rockets going off just like going past you know and thank god like I don't know how this happened, but the entire night, nothing happened to anybody. It was insane. Like we, I don't know how many of the enemy we probably killed that night, but all of us came back unscathed. It was ridiculous. And I remember getting, getting into the Humvee and we're driving away and our, our gunner is uh, rocking a Mark 19 and he's just going through cans of ammo, just taking people out off of rooftops coming out of corridors in, in like street corners, we're hitting roadblocks. IEDs are going off and somehow none of it causes catastrophic damage to our vehicle or to any of us. But I remember at one point he goes dry and I'm handing him this uh, ammo can for the Mark 19. And, and I look out of the window and we're coming up to, to make us turn. And I look out of the window and there's a guy in the courtyard pops out with an RPG on his shoulder and we're turned, we're like turning away from him. So the ass of our vehicle is facing him, light skin Humvee, our gunners dry, like we're trying to get him loaded again. And there's this guy with RPG just staring at us. And for whatever reason, it didn't go off. I, he didn't he didn't fire at us i don't know why to this day it is just like one of those things you know but um but you're still yeah, bracing for impact scary. i imagine like oh yeah ready. oh yeah i in my in my head i was like this is it like yeah. we're done i know i know right now this was my time and i don't know it it just didn't happen and uh and we all got back that night and and i remember just it was so emotional um because we are just on just pump full of adrenaline it 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 truly was a christmas miracle like that we all made it home i still just am mind blown by that event that day but um it was it was like just the beginning uh because after that we we kept going out on these missions and, and then we just started losing brothers and um, it was, it was hard. We had memorial services that we'd hold for them. And, and I just remember being in formation, you know, and like, like these are dudes that I shared barracks rooms with and, you know, like they were my brothers and I, they weren't there anymore. And, and, and you know everything about them, right? Like, because you're just sitting there yeah. with nothing to do, and you know about like what they're going to do when they go home after after the deployment and family and oh god, everything, everything, yeah. And and beyond that, you know, we, I had, I had the responsibility of going to meet the family of the one marine that we did lose um, from my first deployment, 
And so I know, I knew what that felt like, you know, it was, it was really hard, uh, but it was important. And, and it just, every passing day that we were there for that second deployment and having to go through those memorials right then, um, it was just very different. It was, it was good. I, I'm so glad that we had the leadership that we did that forced us to do that um, because we had to face that, that trauma right then and there, you know, and, and it was each other that allowed us to heal from that and get through it. Um, you know, the, the men that I served with are, are some of the most amazing, just full of life people that you could ever meet. Um, you know, and, and we had every possible scenario thrown at us, um, life and death situations every single day. And it, and it was amazing to see just the spirit of these men just persist. It was incredible. Man, I've got so many questions on that. So, you know, you had mentioned at the outset, the PTSD, the TBI, and it's certainly like PTSD for sure is such a, uh, a challenging topic to really understand and unpack. You know, as you think about even that one moment, and you'd already been in combat, but you kind of said like, this is it, this could be my time, right? In that moment in time. Do you, do you look back on some of those, those experiences and think, oh, that was like the buildup of this trauma that I would experience later? Or like, was there one of those events that started it all in your mind or that put like the nail in the coffin? Or is it just an accumulation? It was just an accumulation. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it, there, there wasn't one event. I mean, I, I experienced so much trauma that like, it just, I got numb to it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I had other near death experiences, you know, where like we were just walking back from, uh, a firefight we had gotten into and it was another one of those occasions where we had taken over a compound it was like an abandoned police compound which looking back on that now like that's kind of you know like duh <laughs> what of course we got ambushed there um but it was it was a pretty crazy firefight uh we were pretty much empty on ammo by the time we were we got to a point we could leave um, cause we were pinned down and we had to, we had to call in Cobras uh, and Hueys and they just wrecked the place um, in a good way. Like uh, just destroyed the enemy. But coming back from that, uh, I, there was a sniper round like impacted right here on a vehicle that I was standing right next to, or like walking past. Um, you know, and like that round was meant for me, like it, it just missed barely, you know, and, and it was, uh, so unexpected because of how far away it was that it was just that, that sliver of error. And, you know, it could have been just a finger twitch that did that, um, or his breath, who knows, but like, you know, that was just another day. Um, IEDs, you know, going off like all the time. Vehicles, or I got so many pictures of our vehicles just being destroyed. Uh, it's it's amazing that we lived through some of the stuff we did. But um, yeah, it wasn't. It, there was no one event. It was the accumulation of it, and it was looking back on it now. It was the exposure to that, being numbed to it, never being treated and being brought home sent back out into the wild and just you know left to our own devices um it was never addressed there was never ever a point of like uh you know maybe we should look into this and think about mental health or think about decompression when you come back from a deployment um none of that ever happened 
And, and I didn't even think to think about that. You no, know, we of course thought, we don't. This is how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but it, it added up and, and it wasn't just, I mean, I left, I left the grunts in 2006 and I went to the basic school where I was a combat instructor, um, for new lieutenants. And, uh, and it was a very rewarding duty station where I got to, you know, instill all of my lessons learned in these new officers. But even there, um, you know, all my friends that I knew from the fleet, they were still going out on deployments. I was still losing friends. Uh, I just wasn't present for it anymore. Um, you know, and then I, I had a, uh, a best friend at Quantico. Um, his name is Jay Hoskins. I wear his, his memorial bracelet, but he and I were brothers there. And, um, and he's probably, he's the reason I joined Marsoc. Uh, one of the reasons. But, you know, he he pushed me to be just such a better man and a better Marine. And um, and it was he he got injured um, and got a, a hernia during a martial arts course that we went to together. And he wasn't able to go to selection with me. And so uh, because of that, our paths you know separated and he went back to the fleet and I went to Marsoc. And I was in, um, I was in ITC, our training pipeline. His wife called me and told me that he had been killed in Afghanistan. And it fucking, it brought me to my knees. Like that, that one crushed me and it hurt me a lot. And, um, I wanted to be there so bad for his funeral, but I couldn't, I couldn't drop out of of itc you know and i thought about just our our discussions about marsoc and about that path and i knew that you know he would want me to finish it and and it was it was him and and his sacrifice that really gave me something to to fight for and and to make it through itc because it wasn't easy (laughs) Yeah, no and, doubt. Um, oh, yeah. Man. Um, when you when you mentioned that Jay kind of pushed you hard, I, you know, I mean, you're around Marines for years at this point, and you will go into Marsoc, and but I do feel like there are these people we come across in the military, in particular, who just really push you hard. Could you just speak a little bit, like, what was it that he did that made you so much better? He, um, so he grew up in Texas. He was, uh, he grew up in Plano and he was the Golden Gloves boxing champion growing up. He grew up hard and, um, he just had this, this fighting spirit about him. He was a true warrior, but he was, uh, a family man too, you know, and he had a wife and, and he was building that family. Um, and he was a very strong Christian man. And there was just, he had been in the Battle of Fallujah. Um, and, and he was telling me about some of his experiences. And he was, for instance, in a seven ton that got hit by a VBIED and he lost 17 of 17 members of his platoon. And he was in that vehicle. Um, you know, and it, uh, it was, it was just a time in my career where that, that little bit of reset from the fleet, where that dwell time hits, you realize that, you know, there's a toll, there is a toll to all of that loss and a toll to all the fighting. Um, you know, like there's, there's so many cliche sayings, but like you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Right. And, and what that, I think that means is that there's so much baggage that comes with that, that lifestyle that people don't understand. Um, and it, it takes a toll on your soul ultimately. And, and Jay was a brother that I could talk to about all of that because he understood it and he, and he had shared those same things. Um, 
and and we just we we were also in a platoon with a lot of other combat vets that took things the wrong way right and they're they were the type that you know they wanted to wallow in their misery and just and instead of using that adversity to build them to make themselves better they wanted to wallow in it and and jay and i weren't like that and we um we were quickly kind of like i guess put into these positions to be the the leaders of these other men and and he and i were the the two squad leaders cuz the way that they had this combat instructor company built it was really like two platoons and so we were the platoon leaders um and and he and i just like we were brothers you know awesome. we would bounce everything off of each other uh you know and he taught me how to fight and he taught me um you know, how to push through things. And so we ended up going into the martial arts uh, program together that the Marine Corps had at the time, or they still have it. Uh, But we were at Quantico next to the MACE, which is the Martial Arts Center of Excellence. So like the headquarters of the the Marine Corps martial arts program. And, um, and we got to go through the instructor course there. And, and we went through together and then we ended up both earning our black belts together at the mace. And then uh, he was, he got injured in a, a follow on martial arts course where we were being uh, trained how to be instructors. Uh, so, or instructor trainers. So essentially we would then go run courses to make instructors. And, um, and it was just kind of like, I don't know. He just, he inspired me a lot to just keep pushing and keep being better um, and, and to not, you know, be comfortable, just stagnant. Yeah. At this point, before you get into MARSOC, is there a feeling in between these deployments now, you mentioned kind of the dwell time and reflecting um, and, and some of the trauma building up. Are you looking at the next deployment differently? Like I'm not looking forward to this anymore, or you're starting to really, do you look at the enemy differently? Is it personal in some way? Um, you know, I, I never really thought about that. Uh, I guess I, I just looked at it as, you know, I focus on me and, and my tasks and, uh, in the grunts, I didn't really have the, the mindset to really look beyond that. Um, it's, I guess when I got to Quantico though, uh, and being around officers and, you know, the more academia side of the military, I started studying doctrine, um, and, and was teaching it, uh, you know, so I had to be an expert in it. And, um, and that I kind of started to, to get more wise as to how to apply, uh, you know, combat fundamentals and uh, looking at military strategy rather than just the tactical aspects of it. Um, But it was about probably a year, two years in uh, to that duty station. We're supposed to be there three years. Um, Jay and I just started kind of, we're feeding off of each other and we're like, we got to get back out to the fleet. Like, let's go, let's go to the monitor and find a way to get orders, you know? And so we were trying to figure that out. And then a recruiter came up from our sock and we're like, all right, no, that's what we're going to do. Um, we had just found out about it, you know? And so, uh, that was, that was it. We're like, all right, all in. So, um, you mentioned it's not easy, obviously, these courses getting into MARSOC. I know it was just standing up, right? Like this is a new entity with a lot of pressure to perform. Um, what was the arrival like for you into MARSOC compared to that experience you described being indoctrinated into your platoon as a grunt? Complete opposite. <laughs> um, complete opposite. It was it was a different side of the Marine Corps. Uh, it wasn't even really like traditional Marine Corps and, and that's for good purpose. Um, 
it was the best of the best that the Marine Corps had to offer coming together and then taking lessons learned from all of the other special operations components and then and just putting that into a well-polished program and just building on that. Um, when I, so I was able to PCS down to MARSOC uh, before I went to selection. And so essentially my whole purpose was to prepare for selection. And, uh, and I got about a month, you know, month or so to prepare about a month and a half. Um, so I get down there November, 2008 and go to selection early. It was like the first week of January, um, uh, 2009. And, and, uh, it was the most professional course I've ever been a part of. And I, I say course, but it, you know, it's an assessment and selection process. Um, but there was no yelling. There was no typical, you know, male bravado at all. It was just simple, stoic. Uh, these are the instructions. Go execute. And it's on you to, pre to present yourself in a manner that proves you're capable of being at the table. Um, and it, that was it. It was hard gates. Like, you pass or you fail. And uh, it was cool. What did you do to get ready in that month? Because there's a lot of people who listen to this who are like, what, you know, if I'm going to go to selection for any of these courses, what should I do? So I guess, number one, did you feel like you prepared adequately? Would you have done something different? And like, what did you focus on for that time? Um, so I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, I would have done more land nav with intention. So we did land navigation, but it was like the same land navigation that we had always done in the grunt. We weren't trying to make movement. Um, and it wasn't about time. Right. And, and I think that if I did get a chance to go back and do it again, I would focus on that. Um, just because it, it was like a, a learn on the fly kind of thing. And it sucked. It wasn't fun. You never want that. Um, no, no. You want to you want to go and be in a stud and ready ready for anything. Which I, I guess at the end of the day, I was. Um, you know, we prepared physically uh, very well. Um, we followed a, a programming from uh, Rob Shaw's military athlete, and uh, basically just got after it. Um, I had a, a couple of buddies that, uh, were in that platoon with me and we went in on a bunch of like just random workout equipment and set it up in my garage. I was living off base. Uh, and we would just go haze ourselves in, in that gym. And it was like, it was the, the total cliche, like <laughs> garage gym, like what you would imagine, you know, just iron weight, you know, just clanging. in and we, we ended up getting some like bumper plates so we could do CrossFit style stuff. Um, we had this like pile of tires that we wrapped logging chains around and then attached it to an Alice rack and then would just go running with this sled of tires through the neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, it was crazy, but it worked. I don't yeah. know. It worked in the end. Um, can you talk about maybe one of those ops from your time in MARSOC that comes back? Um, you know, maybe it's just more complex and that's what you reflect on because of the nature of the targets you're going after or the pressure that's on you. Like what, what do you go back to when you think of those ops? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So in Afghanistan, 2012, uh, we, our team uh, kind of leading up to this because, uh, you know, set the scene right here. Um, we had done a huge workup because we, we were an East coast team. So coming from uh, at the time it was called third M Saab. Now it's third Marine Raider battalion. Um, but third M Saab 
we got chopped, our team chopped to Alpha Company first MSOB on the West Coast and at Pendleton. And so we had to leave Lejeune and relocate to California for all of the workup. Uh, and so we were essentially deployed for our deployment workup. And, uh, and so we, we were gone from home for like a really long time and it ended up with like a 90 plus percent divorce rate on our team, but it was like two, two deployments in one. Yeah. And we had just come back from a, from an Africa deployment to a J set, which is kind of like a part of our workup. Um, so we had, we had been gone a long time. Uh, parts of our team were new and, and we we're still working through a lot of the kinks of figuring that out, you know, like how to work with each other. Um, how big's the team like in that case? Is it, or is yeah. it like 12, 12 guys? We had 23. Um, wow. Right. So, yeah. So the core team, core team is 14. You have uh, two elements and a headquarters element. Um, so you have your team commander, team chief, ops chief, and then the elements, uh, element leader, and then uh, four four operators and a Sark. Um, and so then the the rest of the the attachments were uh, everything. For, we had a um maintainer like for our because we had rg 31s so we had to have a, a mechanic and maintainer for those uh we had two comms guys um you know running a plethora of different types of comms um and then we had a, a gtac uh a dog handler uh eod tech um we had miso psyops uh at one point we had some uh civil affairs uh let's see we also had uh sigint and Dang. intel like all source uh we had uh human collector um yeah, yeah everything we had a cook <laughs> yeah all sorts of all sorts of people jumped in you yeah. know, for the, for the deployment and became part of the team. Um, you know, and so we had to do the workup for that. And, and a lot of those guys, uh, you know, some of them had never been to combat. Um, some of our team was pretty young. They had, uh, you know, they, their only experience was the Africa deployment prior to that, um, which was a, it was a counter narcotics training mission. You know, so we weren't engaged in anything. We were just training uh, another nation's special operations forces. And, um, you know, so we, we went into that uh, with some very seasoned leadership, but really junior guys and, and guys that were hungry, right, that wanted to prove themselves. Um, but, you know, the, the enlisted side of our leadership uh, you know, myself included, I was one of the element leaders, um, and my team chief and, uh, ops chief and, and the other element leader, we just had a different perspective. It was 2012. We kind of saw the writing on the wall that, you know, there was going to be a drawdown. Um, Iraq had already been, uh, drawn down and, and I think turned over by that point. Um, you know, so we saw the writing on the wall and to us, it was, uh, you know, we, we had to be more calculated. Like we had already lost a lot of brothers and we had to be able to justify any risk that we were going to take for the team. Um, and, and so leading up to that, uh, we were going to embed into Kajaki and conduct district stability operations where previously all the soft teams had been doing village stability operations. And so we were going to take it up a notch, uh, be the first soft team to go after a whole district. And uh, in order to kind of set the, the tone for that, we did a clearing op 
um, which we called it, they were, they were called dagger ops, uh, back in this time. And we basically planned for, we we're going to fly in from, uh, Leatherneck. So with 160th, fly up to the northern end of Helmand in the Kajaki district and put down in the green zone. Uh, kind of how we did it in Iraq, three supporting positions, um, just take over three different compounds. And then we're going to go out and do uh, operations from there for three days. Uh, so it was, it was for a couple of reasons, which, you know, be careful about sources and methods here, but um, ultimately we were doing uh, like clearing white space and setting the tone for us to come in and be able to establish uh, a local Afghan police force, establish a source network, um, and and build out some other uh, you know programs. Uh, we'll just call it that. And um, and so ultimately, the the plan was to set down uh, and you know duke it out with the Taliban and and just clear space. Um, and the team that was conducting these dagger ops uh, was stationed out of, of Leatherneck. And because it was going to be our team going in, uh, three of us got to go with them. So it was uh, our team chief, myself, and one of our SARCs. Um, and and so my my role in that was to, uh, you know, start building out our, our source network and collecting, um, you know, biometrics, uh and then establish leads for developing sources. Um, and so, you know, we get ready for this mission and, uh, and tell was kind of looking like it would be a fight going in there. Um, we had, we had gone and visited, uh, a local seal team kind of like halfway in between us and, and Leatherneck or where we were going to go, uh, within Sangin Valley. And, uh, and, you know, we've gotten some kind of lessons learned for how they'd been handling, you know, engagements in their area. So we, we had like these ideas of what we wanted to, uh, how we wanted to approach it, I should say. And, um, we get in the air and we're, you know, pushing in, uh, on these, you know, black Chinooks middle of the night and, Originally, we we're going to do a three-click offset, land on the Y, and then hike into our compounds. Um, and then there, there was a lead element of a half-skid Cobra Huey uh, uh, section that went ahead to just like look for any you know potential hazards. Uh, you know, dudes walking around with RPGs and machine guns, PKMs, or whatever, and. Uh, and they sure enough picked up quite a few in our AO and uh, our JTAC just went to town. And like, we were all on comms. We could hear all this, you know, plugged into the bird and hearing so on the flight on. in on the flight. in. Uh, I, I don't, I don't remember the exact number uh, of EKIA, but it was like over a dozen before we even landed. And, uh, and so we're like, all right, well, this is going to be crazy. We got like, Hundred pound rucks because we got three days worth of food oh. and water, um, and ammo. You know, martyrs, rounds, everything. You know, and so like heavy as hell. And we've got uh, probably like thirty Afghan commandos on the bird with us. You know, or, or like it spread out in chocks. Um, but I, there were like thirty in our compound. I remember. It was like a lot of them yeah. and uh, you know, we, we land and they're like, they made a call on the way in, uh, you know, they're like, we're putting you on the X. So sure enough, like, yeah, we, we land um, and, and it's just like chaos, you know, contact. Uh, and we, we go to clear the building and, you know, all good. We're, we're like, okay, we get into our building. Um, and we sat down for the night and then, and it's pretty quiet after this, right? Like we came in and made some noise, you know, we, <laughs> we yeah. had AC one thirties on station, like we were tearing it up. And, uh, and so it was pretty quiet for that first night after that, after our infill. 
And then the next day, um, you know, we're sending dudes out to do local patrols and just establish security within the area. And, uh, you know, they start taking contact, uh, you know, there's guys getting, uh, sniped off of roofs, you know, and we started getting engaged from the tree line, um, you know, and they're, they're like moving on us. So, uh, we start dropping mortars and we had, we had pre pre-positioned everything pretty well within the interior walls of the compound. We had already spray painted all of our azimuths, you know, we had locked everything in. So at this point, you know, we're just basically like, we know like 180 degrees is here, 190 is there. Um, you know, and we're just taking calls from, from our observer on the roof. Like, you know, here's the azimuth, here's the distance. And we're just kind of like, you know, guessing essentially because we got to just get these rounds out and um and i remember like i was i was like kind of nervous you know it was a different level that that we were fighting there um you know the the taliban were a lot more relentless and like willing to fight to the death and just send send their men in and uh and they fought hard you know so it was it was crazy uh, and it was, uh, it was definitely eye opening from that perspective, having and seeing the, the totality of what we could bring is like, even just a small element, the amount of lethality mm-hmm. that we could put out there. And, and even despite that, they just kept coming, you know, and it was, uh, it was just different and, and it definitely stood out. Jeez. You know, you, you were talking about the responsibility of you and some of the the more seasoned vets at that time, looking out for some of the, the newer folks who might be hungry. Did it did you come to a point where you had to push back on a mission or an op or some campaign because you're like, hey, this this isn't worth it, and we got to find a way to just kill it? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there were multiple, uh, you know, patrols or. Uh, you know, like key leader engagements that we would have to like push back against just because they, they were stretching us too much and they, they didn't make sense. Um, you know, we weren't able to have enough of a presence down in the green zone to establish the like reliable source network that we needed to be able to really own the space. Um, and it was, you know, there was a lot of politics too with like how much effort went into being able to go outside of the wire, um, you know, and, and so sometimes the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze and we had to push back on a lot of that. Uh, there, there were times though that, you know, we had to make calls and we were like, yeah, we got to go do this. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of worked out. Uh, in our favor. Um, we we're very deliberate in everything that we did. Uh, you know, I, our, our biggest threat, I think, was IEDs. Um, you know, just that was the, the nature, you know, of what we faced there. Uh, I remember a lot of guys going into the deployment were getting, they're getting tattoos on their legs, like, you know, the little stitch lines says cut here. Um, it was just kind of like a little inside joke we all had because so many dudes were losing limbs from IEDs. Uh, you just didn't know when, you know, you were going to step on a pressure plate or drive over one. And, um, and I took that responsibility personal and, and as an element leader, um, you know, like I'm supposed to be kind of more, I guess, withdrawn to run the element um you know and and kind of like the the i guess expectation was like you would ride shotgun in the vehicle you know as the vc the vehicle commander um and i didn't do that i drove uh because i wanted to make sure that like i did everything i could to bring those boys home bring those men home um you know, and I wanted, I wanted that responsibility. I wanted to make sure that like, if we hit a fucking IED, it was going to be because 
it was just going to be that day, you know, and it wasn't going to be because we failed to, to do our best to look out for it. And, and I took it personal, you know? I mean, it seems like that your career is going really well, but at some point you decide to step out into the contracting space. What's, I, I think, so correct me if I, if I got that wrong, but what's the decision behind that move? Uh, it was, it was a couple of things. So during that deployment, um, there was some just inter interpersonal conflict that we had, uh, and you know, it just, it, it rubbed me wrong. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to dwell too much on that uh that aspect of it just because it it was just a small factor that made it okay for me to say like okay you know I, I can hang up you know my uniform and be proud of what I've done and and walk away now. Uh there were other factors though that really drove it and that was family. At the time I was um you know married to uh someone in the army and she uh she had an opportunity to go down to flight school, become a warrant officer. Um, and I've been just, you know, constantly gone. And at the time it was, you know, I felt it was my duty to give her an opportunity, um, to kind of live out her career. And, uh, you know, so I, I left service so that she could, you know, carry on with her career there. Um, it ended up working out for us. You know, okay. and, uh, she got she got carried away down at flight school, and you know, um, yeah, we got okay. we got divorced because of her actions. So uh, right. it is what it is, you know. Yeah. But um, that was kind of what led me to get out. Uh, at the at the time, I thought I was going to go back to college and uh, finish my degree because. You know, I had, I had tried to go back to school throughout my Marine Corps career, but it was just haphazard at best with all the deployments. And uh, and so I, I felt like I owed that to myself to finish that, close that chapter of my life. And uh, during my time in MARSOC, I got really into fitness. And and so I was, uh, I'd been training at CrossFit Wilmington with Tony Cowden. Um, I was... Uh, one of his coaches there is a CrossFit instructor. Oh yeah. It was, it was incredible to have learned from someone like that. And, um, and so I was really passionate about it and I wanted to maybe start my own gym. Uh, so I was going to, going to go to school for kinesiology. I got in about one semester, um, before, cause I got on, uh, July of 2014. And then, um, with ISIS taking over Iraq and Syria and just all my, you know, history there, uh, I wasn't ready to be done serving. And, and so that's what drew me into contracting. And were you doing kind of what we've probably for people who've listened to this show, they've, they've heard folks who are downrange, um, not in uniform anymore, but still on the pointy end of the spear. Some people on the intel side. Are you able to share kind of kind of what that work looked like? I assume you were still gone yeah. quite a bit, though, Mike. Is that wrong to think? Yeah. No. Um, so uh, after, so I got out in July of 2014. I was uh, divorced in January of 2015. Um, and that's when I, it was also the end of that semester. And so it was kind of like, all right, college didn't work out. I need to get a job now. Cause I don't have a house cause that was just part of our arrangement. Um, you know, she kept the house and so I was like, all right, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and it just, it was another calling, you know, it was like, all right, I, I have talent. Um, I'm pretty good at this Intel stuff, you know, on the team. So I was the kind of like 18 Fox equivalent. Um, and I, I did pretty well, uh, you know, with our Afghan deployment, uh, 
we we were able to identify seven like Taliban members trying to infiltrate our our Afghan local police. Um, and uh, and during that time frame, green on blue was huge. Like I I have lost like more more brothers than I can count on two hands from green on blue. Oh Marsoc, my gosh, Marsoc Jeez. brothers, like dudes I went through ITC with, I was on teams with. You know, it's just uh, so it was real. You know, and and so I took that serious, and we found seven trying to infiltrate. You know, and and um, so I I had that yeah history that experience and i was like all right i can continue doing this you know um by this point i had already kind of gone through my va uh disability stuff and i was you know rated at 90 percent um you know ptsd and tbi and a whole bunch of other things i got facial trauma i got stabbed in the face with the bayonet you know and like all these yeah oh yeah uh (laughs) yeah in training Um, i assume or, or was okay. All right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, that's, that's one of my TBIs. It, uh, broke my jaw this way, that way I got hit right here. Um, shattered my sinus, broke my nose, broke my orbital socket, shattered my jaw and, uh, knocked me out obviously. Uh, yeah. So, um, I don't, why, why, I don't even know why I mentioned that. We were oh, going yeah, to some of my ratings. So, um, I had tried to go the, uh, like GRS route and I ended up getting denied because of my PTSD and, um, I got through everything else, but, uh, that was the kind of, you know, final straw after the poly. And so, uh, I was like, all right, you know, I can't be a shooter anymore. Um, or at least like in my head, I thought that, you yeah. know, like if I can't do that, then I can't, I, I'm not a shooter anymore. Uh, <laughs> if I can't go to the CIA, you know? Uh, yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'll do Intel. And so, uh, I joined JSOC and, um, got into Intel and targeting and, um, it was incredible. It was so challenging for me because it was a world that I had never really been exposed to. Um, you know, like there's, there's like doing special operations and there's doing intelligence and then there's doing it with JSOC. Um, and it was like the best of the best and the most talented, analytically driven people, you know, and it was, it was a learning curve. Like it, it was really challenging, but it stretched me in a good way. And, um, and, and it was also probably a little bit of timing when I got in, uh, you know, just politics being what they are with contracting. Um, one of the contracts had just been rolled into this massive vehicle and the company that won it had severely underbid and basically salaries were cut in half. And so I came in at that time and they had lost almost the entire workforce um, for at least the unit that I was in uh, because it was completely contractor driven. And, you know, not to say that money is everything, but, you know, when you're yeah. making a certain income, you re- you build a lifestyle around that and that your family depends on it. That's your, mm-hmm. how you make your, your money. And um you know, and then to, to say that you're going to take a hundred thousand dollar pay cut, um, that hits hard, you know? So a lot of people left, uh, rightfully so, you know, if I'd been in that position. I probably would have too. Um, but I, I wasn't, you know, I was just coming into the community and so it was a, a perfect opportunity for me. Um, I ended up becoming a, a team leader, uh, for, for this multi-discipline team I had, you know, I think it was 12 analysts underneath me. Um, and it was, it was just so cool. Uh, we were doing some incredible stuff. I did that for about eight months and it got, got that office stood back up, um, and, and mission capable again. And then I, I kind of got bored, uh, like not bored, but like I wanted to be out on the edge again. Cause this was all in the rear. Um, and so 
so I moved over to another organization uh, that basically deploys out in support of JSOC. Um, so I was over at, at uh, that organization deploying downrange, um, you know, with the task force. And so my my first deployment downrange with them was 2016. I was at the 06 Jock, and it was incredible. This was like during uh, this was during the push on Mosul. Yeah. So I was doing like Intel briefs to the commanding officer of that unit on like a daily basis, uh, you know, on on these extremely high value targets that we're hunting, um, ISIS senior leadership in the military. Uh and you know, and it was uh it was high pace you know, high stakes, high pace, and uh, probably one of the, the more rewarding deployments that I've had. Um, the following deployment, I ended up going down to the actual like team level and, and was a targeting officer uh, for the, the expeditionary element of the, of the task force. And um and that was like, oh man, that's, great. that's the stuff that dreams are made of. Yeah, I was I was running like five lines of ISR at a time. I was hunting, uh, so the ISIS senior leadership, but and and military. So where that nexus crossed, and um, and it was just, it was crazy. Uh, we were we were doing strikes just about every day, um, kinetic strikes. We'd send out, uh, troops on the ground for direct action raids, probably at least two, three times a month. Um, and I mean, we're, you know, they're flying, they're going into Syria. They're going, yep. Damn. you know, doing, doing God's work. Um, and, and it was, it was very rewarding being around just people that were working at that high level um, and were just so passionate about what they did. Uh, and we were having real impact. And, and it was so different than my time in, in the military where, you know, like, you know that what you're doing makes a difference and you know that it matters but it's really about the people to your left and your right. And, and that's why you keep fighting. Um, this was so different in that, like, I mean, this is the tip of the tip of the spear. Like the things that we did showed up in the news mm -hmm. and, and it was high level, you know? Um, and it was just so cool because it was just part of the, part of the job, you know? And, and, Nobody talked about it. Nobody, uh, it didn't, you know, there were no like awards. There's no, uh, you know, special congratulations. There's no parties when you come home. Um, it's just, you know, very quiet, silent professionals, you know, like I'd fly in commercial, you know, yeah. in, into these <laughs> war zones, uh, you know, and I'm like going like on the way back, like stopping in Dubai for a couple of days of like R and R, you know, like just crazy times. Um, but so cool. How, how tough was it? Cause I definitely had a, a very similar experience, but having been a conventional aviator, you know, I was watching hits go on, but I wasn't ever a door kicker like you. Was there any, like, number one, I got to assume like maybe one of the guys you would serve with was probably on the, like on a raid that you helped tee up. So I think there's got to be something cool about that. Um, but also, was there any um, like FOMO on your side? Of like, damn, this is cool, but I'd love to be on that raid, man, going in right now. Yeah, it, there was there was so much FOMO. Um, and it was so hard because like, like, these are the tier one operators, you know? And like, like I was with them, you know? And, 
and I never once mentioned that I was a Mark Doc operator. Um, it just, I don't know. It didn't to me matter, right? Like, like I was but it didn't there come to up like a fill they, a different role. Uh, oh man. I, I, they figured it out. Like, yeah, on, I would is, assume, you know, like I, I had to go through a lot of screening and psych right, evals right. and all sorts of shit, you know, so they knew, but it was just, we didn't talk about it. Um, yeah. and it was, it was kind of cool. Uh, so the, the J3, uh, so the, the fires officer who had approved the strikes was a dude that I went through ITC with. No and way. Was, oh yeah. Oh yeah. He had gotten over there and um, he had done the long walk, but uh, it was so rewarding hearing, like I would work out these targets and then pass it to the, to the strike force commander and, you know, like give him all the details, like, Hey, this is our target. We've been following him for this long. We got these kinds of, um, Got these indicators that confirm this, you know, like blah blah blah, and uh, it was like, all right, call it over to Strike Bridge, and then to hear my, you know, like <laughs> former Marsoc buddy over there, and he's approving yeah, these strikes, cool. you know, and he's like, who, he's like, who worked up this target, <laughs> you know, and it's like, <laughs> all right, yeah, but it's it, good to it go, was, uh, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was, uh, it was a very unique time. Man. All right. So I know we could go for hours on this. So like, I, I'm going to bring this to a close, but there certainly, um, you know, you talked about some of these really tough experiences and we didn't really dwell on it, but the fact that you had to do family notification and that you were present during multiple, um, memorial services downrange, the guys I've been, you know, going on 140 people that we've talked to on this show, like, I can't even remember somebody who had to do family notification or was there for a memorial who didn't say that was the hardest part of being in service. So like the fact that you went through that, the near death experiences, um, you know, could you speak just a little bit more to this event that you found yourself in and how you were dealing with PTSD just so people get a little more flavor and we can ask them to step up and help here? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think one of the things that goes um, unspoken of with PTSD and combat experiences is survivor's guilt. Um, and I don't think that we talk about it enough because it's a real thing. Uh, and I've done, since this event, I've done a lot of healing. Um you know, therapies, uh, treatments, procedures, inpatient, like, you know, I've gotten some of the best treatment available. And, um, and during a lot of that, the things that keep coming up are the friends and brothers that I've lost, you know, and like, that's, that's the pain that I hold. Um, and you have to wonder sometimes, like, those events, you know, like the RPG, the sniper shot, the IEDs, all of that, um, you know, like why, why am I still here? And they're not, uh, you know, and, and that's a hard thing to grapple with as a man, I think, especially, um, you know, because we're supposed to be these strong figures that just persevere. And, uh, you know, I was, I was doing that. And I thought that, I thought that I had dealt with things, um, appropriately, you know, like I, I did what I was told to do. I went to the VA, I got my, you know, disability claim and I'd gone through, you know, whatever treatment they suggested, um, which was really not helpful to be fair. Uh, and, and it, it is, I think, kind of sidebar real quick. The VA does get a really bad rep um, for good reason in some areas, but there are also good parts of the VA. And I've, I've figured that out, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the wrong way. But, um, you know, so there are, there are good parts of the VA that I have found now. Um, but at the time, the, that part of the VA that I was, uh, at just didn't, they didn't have enough resources 
to adequately care for all the veterans. And um, with that, uh, you know, I, I thought I was doing the right things. And in reality, I had just been putting a Band-Aid on things. Um, I never really dealt with everything because I had, I had separated from service but only for like a little bit. And then I got right back into the contracting and JSOC treats its contractors like unit members, you know, so it was like, I never left. Um, and, and so leading up to the event, I had, uh, taken further challenges upon myself by starting my own company, uh, to get after a lot of the gaps that I saw in <clears throat> the Intel and special operations community when it came to the great power competition. And, uh, you know, the, the amount of pressure that I put on myself, uh, carrying all of that guilt and, you know, just trying to push myself even harder and further because, you know, like my brothers aren't here, you know, and like, they don't even have that opportunity. So I have to do it for them and I have to push hard. Um, and I, uh, I carried that really heavily so much so that I pushed myself to the brink. And, um, unfortunately, like the human body and mind can only take so much. And when I had done that, the, drug that the VA had prescribed to me, um, you know, in retrospect, I'd been on it for four and a half years. Turns out you're not supposed to take it for more than 12 weeks. And can, can you mention the name of, of it, Mike, or if we got to leave it out, that's fine. Yeah. But just in case no, other people no, are on it. it and yeah, new vigil, which is uh new vigil is also, it's like the sister drug to pro vigil. Um, so if you're on either of those, I suggest getting off of them. Uh, you know, one, the, the side effects to it are psychosis and hallucinations. Um, since I went public with my story, there's been numerous people that have reached out to me and had similar experiences on that drug. Um, it's also, like I mentioned, not supposed to be taken for more than 12 weeks. Uh, in fact, the longest known study only went two years and they that's how they found out about psychosis and hallucinations and they just cut it off. Um, you know, so, but I didn't know any of this. Uh, the VA didn't tell me, you know, and it is what it is. Uh, I, I thought it was helping and it was for a while. Um, you know, honestly, the reasons why I started taking it were for work performance. Um, you know, the, the toll of, of all of that had built up and, and I was suffering. Um, I had kept everything bottled inside for so long that, uh, it was starting to come out in ways that I couldn't even control. So like my sleep was just destroyed. I, um, even to this day, I still have like horrible night sweats. Sometimes I have night terrors, um, during that time, it was like really bad and I wasn't even able to, to get restful sleep. And so I was just not functioning at work. I wasn't able to focus, um, maintain, you know, conversations. I would just kind of fall asleep. It was, it was crazy. Um, and it was, it was probably more PTS or more TBI than PTSD, um, but at the time, the VA had rated me for 0% on my TBIs, even though I have like documented TBIs. Uh, there was, there's actually a scandal from 2014, 2015, where doctors were being forced to code uh, veterans incorrectly because uh, they were under the premise that PTSD, PTSD goes away. So if you just rate them as PTSD because the symptoms are so similar, then we can just be done with it. Um, you know, and so that, that kind of tells you like some of the stuff that's going on at the VA gives you an idea. Um, but yeah, so, uh, 
the medication was to help address more of the, the PTSD side of things. Um, but it has serious contraindications for TBI. And um, because they had incorrectly coded me there, it, it didn't, it wasn't flagged, I suppose. Um, I later on, uh, a retired sergeant major convinced me to appeal and get the, you know, TBI documented. And thank God I did. Um, and so I did that. Uh, and I ended up getting 100% total and permanent, um, which is probably going to be one of the saving graces for me going into this trial now. Because it's it is documented, um, and it does show the the failure of the VA's part in in this. So, um, but yeah, you know, ultimately, uh, there's definitely a toll to to combat and um, to our time in service, and and I'm hoping that by me sharing my story. Uh, all of my friends and all of the uh, active duty military members that are going to be getting out at some point take heed and and really prioritize their mental health. Um, there's so many great programs and opportunities for healing. The individual has to be willing to do it, though. And, and if you don't do it, your body and your mind will find a way to have it come out because the hu humans are resilient to a point. Um, so, yeah. So some of the asks here, one is um, you're being represented by UAP, right? That's the, the acronym yes. for this company or this pr nonprofit. Um, yeah. So in the description of this episode, you can find a link to donate to UAP to representing not just Mike, but a lot of other vets who are in tough spots too. Um, so that is one ask. The other is uh, writing to the governor in North Carolina, asking for what would you say, Mike, is the best ask here to help the case that you're in? Uh, at this point, the way that things have gone with the uh, district attorney and the prosecutor, in Onslow County, um, they've essentially stated that in in my particular case, they see me as a violent criminal and uh, not worthy of my case being transferred to the Veterans Treatment Court that exists in Onslow County that is state funded um, for cases exactly like this, where um, you know, there's extenuating circumstances. Uh, and, and so the, the district attorney and prosecutor have essentially, uh, tripled down at this point. Um, and they're pushing for a criminal trial. Then, uh, within that I'm facing two felonies and two misdemeanors with the potential, uh, sentence of 35 years. And so, uh, you know, I have a wife and, and three daughters. Uh, I have a company, I have a nonprofit, I have friends and family. And, um, you know, like I am still a contributing member to society of a high degree. Uh, you know, I, I don't say that to brag. It's just reality. I'm a high performer and, and I have a hell of a resume and, you know, I'm 39 years old. My life is still ahead of me. This is not how we treat our veterans. Uh, and unfortunately, at this point, the only the only hope I have is that the governor sees this uh, for what it is. And he is a reasonable man and can intercede and expunge the charges before I have to go face a criminal trial on September 11th and make a mockery of our, our justice system. And the the ask is to expunge. Is it to move to the veteran treatment court? Uh, so at this point, the the only person that can allow it to go to a veterans treatment court is the district attorney, and he has uh, okay. tripled down on his answer on that. And so, yeah, it's someone's got to take it from his hands, and, uh, and that's the governor, and he has the power to expunge. Jesus Christ! Um, and and so to to that effect, I have written a letter to the governor myself. 
uh, that letter has been published on uh, UAP's website. So UAP.org, um, United American Patriots. And if anyone, um, you know, wants to help, that that's a read my letter to the governor, understand, you know, the, the facts of the case in that article and and then write your own letter. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. It's all electronic. Um, I know they get read because uh, we've also had some other people, you know, in pretty powerful positions intercede and, and push it to to their attention as well. But they just need to hear from the public, honestly. This needs to be a public matter because it isn't just about me. This is bigger than just me. It's about how we treat our veterans. Yeah. Um, and and honestly, our military and our veteran, our warrior class is a reflection of our society and our country. And if we can't fix that and heal that, America has no hope. No. Um, and so we got to get this right. Jeez. All right. Well, we'll have all the links in the description so people can help here. Um Mike, there's two questions to ask everybody before getting you out of here. Um, one is, when you were downrange, is there anything you carried with you that had sentimental value that you just wanted on you? Uh, good luck charm, something that somebody had given you. Yeah. Ugh. For those who are listening and can't see right now, Mike's going behind him to grab something. Yeah, sorry. So, got this... Um, it's like a little pendant. Uh, it looks like an angel. I think it's St. Michael. Um, but it was given to me by my mother. Um, you know, and I carried that in my, uh, like, shoulder pocket for all of my deployments. She wow. gave it to me when, uh, when I graduated boot camp. And, uh Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, and then the last question, and obviously this one I think carries more weight for you than most people given what you're going through. But I like to ask people as they look back on a lot of those deployments, the near-death experiences, the losses. Um, you know, we didn't even talk about suicide in, in this community, but some of the pain you go through. If you look back, would you do it again? 100%. Without question. And, and on top of that, I'm going to push my children to do it too. Um, because I think it matters. I think standing up for what you believe in, fighting for values, for people, uh, for an ideology, for our America, for our constitution, our republic, that matters. And it's a worthy endeavor. Love it. Mike, thanks so much for the time, man. Uh, I wish you so much luck. And if there's something we can do with the platform we have is, you know, as small as it might be, we're here to help. Man. Thank you. Really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. This is admittedly a very tough one to see what Mike's going through with a wife and three daughters. Please help out if you can. I know it's not easy, but this is just not how we should be treating veterans when we have special courts set aside to help with these cases. Um, just a few listener comments before we round out here. The first is from a subscriber, 6172 Crew One. He says, my dad flew the A7D with the 357th and the 353rd. I grew up seeing him every day, MB and DM as a kid. This was in relation to the Jet Jernigan interview. And it was all about obviously his path to being an F-16 pilot and growing up around some of these aircraft. So very cool to see the same parallel. Another one, and this is on the Mike Lefebvre round two, says, uh, this is at Life Hold Strategic. He says, this was another great podcast. I was on the plane as part of General Franks' uh, PSD personal security team when it landed in Herat. As stated, the runway was a full dog and pony show. During the flight in, one of the guys from the MP security team started throwing up and it started a small train reaction. Fun times in the back. Uh, this is such a great, just a great vignette of what really goes on. <laughs> um, this is just being there with a general moving around the battlefield and uh, throwing up in the back of an aircraft. So love hearing that. Thanks for these vignettes. They just make me smile as I hear them. And then the last uh, comment, this is from Dave Wiley 654 and it's on the Mike Rutledge interview again. Mike was a former SEAL and 160th pilot. And he says, there has to be a huge percentage of listeners who are fathers here that cannot understand how you could ever turn your back to a child. This man, Mike, missed out 
being the proudest father on earth. Mike is a hell of a guy, and one could only wish their children have the tenacity and drive that Mike has. I'm with him 100% on the visceral disdain for bullies of any type. It's been a point of trouble for me through my life trying to quell this hatred. Uh, these days, I can stop myself most of the times, but it never really goes away. God bless you, Mike. You're a fine American, my friend. And thanks as usual, Ryan, for a great episode on my favorite podcast. With a C average, they will immediately put me in a fighter plane. A lot of laughing faces. I actually spit coffee out of my nose. Rutledge in Guam. I'll never forget hearing Benning, Bragg, Bragg, Wiley, Fort Polk. I so relate with him. Really appreciate how much this connected and you taking the time to leave this uh this comment with us. Uh, Mike's a great guy. I served with him you know, very briefly. I can't even say I served with him. I trained with him. Um, and it was so great to reconnect after all these years, having just seen him in flight school. But there was no doubt he was going to go on to great things. And what uh, Dave here is referring to about his kids is, for those who haven't listened to the episode, it's a good one. Um, Mike wasn't around for many years with his kids. I mean, he was a SEAL from the mid-90s on and then was flying with 160 after 9-11. I mean, he spent a lot of time downrange and gave everything he had, and it meant not a lot of time with his kids, which he's trying to make up for now. So I think a lot of us can appreciate how, how hard that must be, and it's a great call out, Dave, so thanks for sharing it. All right, um, please do help uh, Mike Block if you can, y'all. He's in a very tough spot with a family to think about, and... Uh, do what you can there in terms of writing to a government official or donating if possible. And with that, stay safe.